Well, let me say a very good evening to all of you. I wish I had come here during the day because as I was driving into Oxford, through Oxford for the first time ever, I was really taken aback by the age and the history um, of this city. And the, I'm someone who's always been very interested in, in history and it would have been nice had I known that. So I would have probably come in here earlier and spent the day here uh, before coming to address you uh, this evening. Um, I'm honored to have been invited to this prestigious learning institution as it commemorates about almost 200 years of existence. And I hope that this address will add value to the reputation and culture that you have here. I've been asked to talk about a few topics uh, which include leadership, democracy, conservation and the illegal wildlife trade. So I shall just confine myself to the period during my term of office and that of my predecessors. But if I just briefly say something about um, myself, I was born here in the UK, uh, in the county of Surrey, and lived here for three years before going to Botswana. Uh, then it was called Bechuanaland Protectorate. And the reason why I was born here was because my parents were here in exile as a result of the South African government at the time taking exception to the fact that a black man had married a white woman um, and living on the border, on their border, near their border of South Africa. So the British government then agreed with the South African government to uh, bring them over here and keep them in exile. In fact, recently a film has been produced about their story of that time called A United Kingdom and a book also written called The Color Bar by Susan Williams. Um, well, to cut a long story short, went through school like everyone else and I came back here to Chichester College and also the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Uh, did pilot training in Belgium and then from the army uh, which I joined and then went on to, to lead it, I entered politics which was not on my radar at the time. I had no intention of ever going into politics and I uh, was asked by my predecessor to join him as his vice president uh, in about 1998. And during that time, um, I did, in addition to military work, I started some of the other things that were passionate to me, uh, one being conservation. So now I am uh, the tourism ambassador for the country. I'm the champion for the vision. I am patron of the arts and culture, uh, chancellor of the University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And um, I'm over here in the UK attending a, the Illegal Wildlife Trade Conference, representing Conservation International, because I am a they appointed me as the Distinguished Fellow for them to, rep to represent them on the African continent. And yesterday I was also ushered in as the Chairman of the Board of the Elephant Protection Initiative. Turning to the subject of leadership, which is very broad and complex, but one important lesson that I've learnt about leadership especially political leadership, is that it should never be and it is not about the leader himself or herself or their interests. 
and it should be entirely about the people that they represent. Government should be and is about being the accountable custodian of the resources of a country which should be channeled entirely to improve the well-being of all citizens and the environment. During my tenure in office as the President of Botswana, I introduced a roadmap of the five Ds. The Ds representing democracy, development, dignity, discipline and delivery. I spent a lot of time traversing the country, consulting our citizens to ensure that I lived by those five Ds. And I viewed my role primarily to embark upon nationwide engagement and address day-to-day -day events and processes and challenges that the country faced. Through these nationwide tours, I got to appreciate firsthand the living conditions of our citizens. I learned about their interests, their views, their perceptions, and importantly, what they expected of the government to do when it came to improving their lives. By this approach, I viewed the country as a classroom, and that the citizens as my teachers, and me, the student, to listen and to learn and then graduate to respond to their expectations. And never did I stop listening, and therefore, as a result, neither did I ever stop learning. We have seen leaders in some countries being driven by self-interest, refusing to relinquish power, changing their constitutions in order to extend their stay, claiming that it is the people who want them there. Whereas we know the truth being that it's a different story as many of their people are disgruntled and unhappy with their administration. Such leaders lose touch and have lost touch with their citizens and make the position of leadership all about themselves. But surprisingly, when you talk about making leadership all about oneself, it happens even in some democracies, as is the case currently in the United States of America, where unbelievable arrogance and immaturity, along with gross incompetence, is on display daily. Leech of the nature that I described earlier applies in all spheres of life. And I remember very vividly that when I was at Sandhurst, the motto of Sandhurst was serve to lead. Moving on to the topic of democracy, I'll share with you some insights on how Botswana has maintained its position as one of the top three dem most democratic countries in Africa, and generally the importance of dom democracy for a country. This provides an invaluable opportunity for me to share Botswana's journey with you and the role that democracy continues to play in advancing Botswana's development trajectory. You may be aware that we recently celebrated 52 years of independence just last month, having attained independence from Great Britain. Take into consideration the fact that Botswana was very poor. In fact, we were one of the poorest countries in the world at the time. It is not surprising that people want to know how the country was able to turn its fortunes around to become a successful modest, uh, model of democracy in Africa. There is no magic involved in the achievement. Whilst a number of our African sister countries overturned the independence constitutions, replacing multi-party democracies with one-party systems, Botswana remained resolute in her advancement of the multi-party system. Our founding fathers were visionary enough to realize that in order to achieve and maintain political stability post-independence, there was need to craft a judicious balance between republican and traditional systems of governance. This was in recognition of the fact that Botswana are ruled by, or was ruled by chiefs, where the chief presided over what we called the Kota, 
which is a village assembly, in which people deliberated on public policy and issues of governance. I can personally attest to the critical role that the institution of the chieftainship plays in promoting the ethos of democracy. Thus, Botswana's independence constitution established a government based on the Westminster parliamentary system, a national assembly based on a unicameral parliamentary system with parliament as the only legislative house. A second chamber called the House of Chiefs was also established and comprised of chiefs of various ethnic groups that make up the nation state of Botswana. In my view, Botswana's exceptionality as a stable democratic state derives in part from the blending and interacting of traditional and republican institutions. Even though the House of Chiefs does not have legislative powers and only serves in an advisory capacity, the assembly, the People's Assembly mechanism stands out as an effective forum for public consultation between the government and citizens. Our democracy is thus embedded in a culture of tolerance and mutual respect in which individual rights go hand in hand with responsibilities and, respons and consideration for the dignity of others. Botswana has been and has been continuously ranked as amongst the best on issues of governance, rule of law and anti-corruption by international rating agencies such as Transparency International on Corruption Perception Index, the Mo Ibrahim Index on African Governance and Moody's Investor Service and Standard and Poor on Credit Worthiness. Turning to conservation. Well, just before I do that, let me just pass by something slightly controversial in that I felt that as a country, as a state which is part of the international community, as part of the family of nations, that we should also attempt to ensure that democracy should be adapted by others. And therefore, where we saw that there was a deficit in democracy, I did not, and my administration did not shy away from criticizing those who we felt were in decline when it comes to democracy. Such examples was Zimbabwe, when it was under President Mugabe, North Korea, and still applies today, Syria, these are just examples. The Democratic Republic of Congo, currently under Joseph Kabila. Venezuela and China. And I was always put out by what I would call hypocrisy and human rights. Where we found that countries in the West, including this country, had always portrayed themselves as the champions and the watchdogs of democracy around the world. But then when economic fortunes or trade or military sales came into the equation, they conveniently forgot about that role that they had accorded themselves. And so like today, we have a very prime example of a country like Saudi Arabia, who have been engaged in a war in Yemen. And when they commit crimes against humanity, countries like the United States and the United Kingdom are silent. And watching the news, as we have done in the last week or so, we've heard about a Saudi Arabian journalist who went missing in their embassy in Turkey. And once again, the silence is deafening from the countries I've just mentioned. That is the hypocrisy that I'm talking about. And even with a country like China, which is now the second biggest economy in the world, 
we see the same thing happening. That the desire to do trade with the second biggest economy in the world overshadows and overrides the lack of democracy in that country, the amount of corruption that goes on there, the human rights violations, the land grabbing that goes on in the South China Sea, and the oppression of free speech. And these are things which have always concerned me greatly by those who should be leading and demonstrating what kind of place we want this world to be. And another example is when the International Criminal Court was set up. We in Botswana were pretty much a lone voice during my time in office when we saw other countries on the African continent threatening to pull out as state parties to the statute, to the Rome Statute. When all of a sudden it was realized that the International Criminal Court can prosecute sitting heads of state, suddenly they regretted ever having signed on to the Rome Statute and some have threatened to leave as a result. Turning to conservation and the pre preservation of Africa's natural resources, there was a declaration called the Habroni Declaration for Sustainability in Africa, being a regional action platform committed to supporting the transition of constituent governments towards a green economy and conservation of the continent's rich ecological resources through natural capital accounting. It was launched in 2012, following the Summit for Sustainability held in Botswana. Presently, there are 13 countries who have signed up. The GDSA, as I'll now call it, places emphasis on putting an economic value on nature, ecosystems, and natural resources. It has to be noted that for too many decades, a lot of developing countries treated nature and ecosystems as resources and not as assets. That has led to the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, including finite resources, without appreciating their real economic value, without investing in nature for the continued benefit of our future generations, and without investing the revenues from natural resources utilization in building sustainable and inclusive societies. Therefore, it is anticipated that through the GDSA, we could achieve a balanced development for African natural resources through undertaking programs geared towards sustainability, such as natural capital accounting, ecosystem valuations, ecosystem management, and restoration initiatives. This would provide the necessary guidance to policymakers to undertake initiatives that do not bleed the natural environment. Seen as a breakthrough and born of the London Conference on Illegal Wildlife Trade as a global initiative, the Elephant Protection Initiative, in which rain states, partner states, NGOs, private citizens and the private sector work in partnership in order to provide both immediate and longer term funding to address the elephant crisis through full and timely implementation of the African Elephant Action Plan by accessing public and private sector support through the creation of a long-term fund that provides guaranteed financial support for all participating rain states for the implementation of national elephant action plans on the basis of threat to elephant populations and need and further provides incremental payments linked to overall elephant numbers and growth in elephant populations. But in addition to this, it also seeks to protect, very importantly, the livelihoods of people. Because elephants do cause a lot of damage to people's crops, to people's property, and in some cases, people do lose their lives. So the action plans that member states have to come up with is strategies for the protection of elephant and the protection of people's livelihoods. I'm personally committed and wish to do all I can to continue to help 
the illegal wildlife trade. The trade is an organized crime. If we allow it to flourish, not only does our wildlife and biodiversity suffer, but all the things that come with organized crime, lawlessness, declines, declining levels of security, poverty, increased levels of violence, all flourish with it. Conservation matters to me personally, and it matters to my country, Botswana, and to many other leaders on the African continent. In my personal capacity, I will continue my work with renowned NGOs of both in my country and outside. The EPI, the Elephant Protection Initiative, is not only a personal commitment, but a national enduring commitment to the goals to end the ivory trade, encourage others to close down their domestic markets, commit to placing our ivory stockpiles beyond economic use, and to implementing our national elephant action plans, and to ensure that communities that live around elephants do not suffer for it. These are nation's commitments to work together to ensure that the solutions identified by the EPI are implemented across the continent so that we implement solutions that will last for generations. I think on that note, allow me to stop thus far. Um, I think I was given about 15 minutes. I hope I've kept within that time, pretty much, more or less. And I look forward to engaging with yourselves. Thank you. Thank you for those opening remarks, President Khan, which covered a great range of topics. I want to begin by asking you about the long-term prospects for Botswana's economy. Uh, do you worry that diamond mining will become less profitable over the coming years, given the arguable overmining of diamonds in Botswana and the development of things like synthetic diamonds? And do you worry that the Botswana economy is too dependent on the mining industry and the diamond mining industry? Well, you've said a lot there. Um, I don't think we are over mining diamonds, uh, not at all. In fact, if you look at the number of carrots which are being mined today, it's actually less than a few years ago. During the period of the recession and the commodity um, uh, price um, decline, um, we had to reduce because the market dictated that. So. In a, in a way, I would say, I may be shot for saying so, but it was a blessing in disguise because we could see an end to the life, you know, because, you know, the diamonds are finite. And you could see that there would be, there, there is a time when um, these mines would have to be closed down um, if others are not, are not found. So during that period, because there was a slowdown, in the, in the diamond mining, it had the effect of extending uh, the life of these, of, these, of these diamonds as a resource. Yes, indeed, for many years we have been dependent on, on diamonds, the economy. It has been the main driver of our, of our revenues for the country. Um, but I would like to more or less say that it's not so much dependence on diamonds. We shouldn't say we should diversify uh, not only into other sectors, which we are attempting to do, but even to other minerals. And we have in recent years um, opened up other mines in areas of copper. Uh, we've got uh, soda ash, we've got nickel, um, and, and we've found quite substantial deposits of, of, of iron ore. But again, all those did fall under the umbrella of the commodity price um, uh, downfall decline several years ago. So yes, it is something that we are very conscious of. And that is why we made a deliberate decision to go into ensuring we exploited fully all the downstream activities and benefits we could get from diamond mining. Because at the beginning, we were only just a producer. We had the mines and the diamonds were taken out. They were cut and polished in other countries. They were sold in other countries like over here. And now we have a situation where we moved the diamond sales from London to our own capital. We set up a number of cutting and polishing factories in, in our country as well. So fully exploiting and also created uh, a, a, an, an another um, of our own uh, parastatal 
outside of the diamond trading company um, um, called the Okavango Diamond Company, which sells diamonds separately from, from the mainstream. Spe continuing on this theme of economics, I want to ask about the role that China uh, can play in the development of Southern Africa. You mentioned in your speech the problems that China has with regards to its own rights, uh, democracy, etc. Uh, do you worry about the investment coming from large Chinese companies, and state-backed enterprises, into countries like Botswana? Do you worry that this could affect the sovereignty and decision-making processes in these key economic areas? No one should worry about anybody coming in and genuinely investing if they are adding value into the economy of that country. But my experience uh, with China's investment is that one, we found poor workmanship, for example, with in construction companies. They would take shortcuts in some of the construction work that they, would, that they would do. It was more or less like, well, this is Africa, let's take advantage. Doing things in Africa that they wouldn't actually do in their own country, and if they did, there would be very serious consequences of the type you know as well as I do. Um, uh, corruption, as we all know, even the Chinese Communist Party admits that it has to deal with uh, a lot of corruption in, the, in, in, in their own country. And then there was always the desire by them to try and bring in as many of their people into these countries to work um, to the detriment of our own citizens. And so when I was in office, I was very, very um, uh, robust about uh, Chinese immigration into Botswana because we were not set up to employ Chinese people, but to provide employment for our own people. So if Chinese companies were coming in, really the people that they bring in should just be at the senior management level. But everyone else should be, um, uh, should be citizens of our own country. And when they would grant or extend loans or grants, putting up a school or so on, it would always come with um, a condition that uh, a Chinese, another Chinese company should come in and build that school. Mm -hmm. And then when the school was built, they stay in the country. They don't go away. Um, they, don't go, they, they don't go back. Um, importing Chinese uh, material from China to the exclusion of our own products. And as I said, trying to bring in their own laborers to the exclusion of ours. So we, we, we cracked down on that. But um, in other countries on the continent, I think they realized later on um, that this didn't quite go, the relationship didn't quite work out um, as they had expected. And we see that some of the loans and grants which have been extended, some have difficulties in, 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 in paying them back. And we see strategic facilities, they could be airports, they could be seaports, now taken over uh, by, 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 by the Chinese and run uh, in lieu of, the, of the, uh, the loan repayment. So continuing on this idea that the challenges of development, uh, do you worry that uh, economic development in Botswana is at odds with conservation, particularly given the thriving tourism uh, industry that you mentioned? Uh, how can Botswana preserve its, its uh, ecological, its cultural, its national heritage, as well as encouraging to develop more tourism and more industry? Through natural capital accounting, which is what we are doing and what I referred to when I was giving my opening remarks. So we are very conscious, you know, we introduced EIA legislation, for example, to ensure that any kind of development, infrastructure development, for example, this is just an example, that you, before you can undertake it, there should be um, environmental impact assessment done to ensure that it's not going to in any way harm the environment. Because we have to ensure that anything we do has to be done in a sustainable way. And we must contribute as a nation, international community, to the preservation of our planet. And that's why we signed up to, to COP21 and we take that very seriously. Moving on to the field of international relations, I want to ask about uh, the support you mentioned for the International Criminal Court in your speech. Uh, there are some who have accused the ICC's prosecution process of being systematically racist against Africans. 
Uh, do, you, do you find this to be a characterization of those who themselves have committed crimes, or is there some truth in that accusation, do you think? If I remember, there are three ways that you can be referred to the ICC. One is through the United Nations Security Council. Secondly, the chief prosecutor, who currently is from Africa. She actually spoke here yes. last year. Really? Okay. Suda, yes. Right. Um, uh, referring the matter to a panel of judges. Or thirdly, by um, countries who are state parties to the Rome Statute, themselves always also referring somebody. So on the continent of Africa, some of those who have been referred have been referred by African countries themselves. So we have people from Africa as judges in the court. And as I've just said, the chief prosecutor is from Africa. So I don't believe it's racist in any way. And if any country felt, who is a member of the Rome Statute, that there are areas that they're unhappy with, you don't leave the organization. That doesn't the answer. The thing is, you try to correct it from within and not from without. And that is our position, uh, or has been our position up to now, as Botswana. Botswana has thrived as a democracy next to countries that have had a more challenging relationship with democracy recently, notably South Africa under Jacob Zuma and Zimbabwe. Um, are you more optimistic uh, about the prospects for uh, peace uh, and state building in Zimbabwe now that Mugabe has resigned and we've seen new elections, or do you think it will be more of the same under, under the new ZANU leadership? No, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic. You know, the one thing is that um, history does teach you a lesson. And I think um, in Zimbabwe, they have learnt the errors of their ways under uh, Robert Mugabe. And, um, you know, we saw a total dismantling of democracy in that country. We saw people being brutalized in the way that they were. We saw the country being brought down to the economic collapse that it is today because of that. So um, I think now, um, I sense that there is a real determination by the new president of Zimbabwe and his party to, you know, to take a uh, change course and to map a way forward which will bring prosperity to the people of Zimbabwe. I know that Botswana and South Africa have often worked together in support of democracy in Zimbabwe. Was that task made more difficult under the leadership of Z Jacob Zuma uh, or was it not an issue for bilateral cooperation? No, I, I don't think it was made more difficult. I think he was keen, because whenever yeah. I used to engage him, I remember him saying on several occasions that, you know, we belong to this common organization called SADC. Yeah. And, you know, there are times when he chaired it, um, uh, South Africa chaired it. And, and, you know, he was always keen to get Zimbabwe off the agenda of SADC, because we didn't want to be going around fighting fires on, uh, in, in the region. The whole idea was to try and bring about economic cooperation to be able to grow the region, to promote industrialization, um, to benefit the people of SADC. But some of the times we found a lot of our time was taken up by putting out, trying to put out fires, you know, in countries like Zimbabwe, in Madagascar, in Lesotho, and so on. And he was very, very much engaged and, 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 and committed to, to bringing that about. It was really, I think the only differences could have just been about the approach. That is why when I took office in 2008, it was around the same time that there was one of those disastrous uh, elections that they had in Zimbabwe. And that's when I said that um, I, I didn't recognize Mugabe as president when he, when he was declared president in that country. But others in Sadiq were a bit um, taken aback by that stand. But I think that um, sent a signal that no, we're not just going to continue rubber stamping um, brutality uh, in, in that country. And if it means that we have to take a different position to bring about a change in that country, then it's worth doing it. Because at the end of the day, we shouldn't just think about our situation if things were going well in our countries. Um, as a democracy, we should be just as concerned about others uh, in the region and on the continent and the rest of the world. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to move to questions from the audience now. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. So please. Yeah, in the air. Let's start with the uh, gentleman here right behind you. 
Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for your opening remarks and for your presence today. My name is Temito Pajileye. I was uh, Secretary of the Oxford Africa Society last year, and uh, we uh, hosted, about this time a year ago, we hosted the uh, uh, former president of South Africa, Kalema Motlante, who was a strong advocate of the African cult of people's and human rights. So I think Botswana is not yet a state party to the African cult, and uh, you've repeated uh, tonight also how a strong supporter you are of the ICC. So I would like to know if there's like a, an ideological or bureaucratic impediment for Botswana to join the group of state parties to the African cult. I didn't see, see to join so a state I party to which, which to institution? To the African Court of uh, Human and People's Rights. Okay, okay, now I'm here. No, basically, should I answer that now? Yes, please. Okay, no, th there's, there's no real impediment. It just depends, you know, if I give an example, in SADC, uh, SADC set up a tribunal, which was then dismantled, because um, it was felt that um, the tribunal had powers over our own domestic courts. And initially that was the, the thinking. Because I remember there was one famous case of some Zimbabwean farmers who took their case to the SADC tribunal, who ruled in their favor against the Zimbabwean government. And the Zimbabwean government said, no, but hold on. Um, they haven't exhausted all the channels that they should be using the court process in Zimbabwe. They hadn't gone to the, the, the uppermost court in, in Zimbabwe. And then we found that uh, Zimbabwe had a case in that even in our own country, we had not domesticated the tribunal in Botswana to be a court that could sit above, that there's this regional court that can sit above um, the, the, our own courts, in our case, the final court is the Court of Appeal. But then at the end of the day as well, it was not supposed to be um, a court in that sense. It was supposed to be a tribunal which was supposed to adjudicate on the issue of the implementation of SADC protocols. So even with this court, the African Court on Human Rights, it was also an issue of the jurisdiction it has over and above our own courts. So we felt certainly during my period uh, in office, that our, court is, our courts are the final courts on all those issues. And we didn't think it necessary to sign up to uh, having the, the African court being able to override uh, the decisions of our own courts. And I don't regret that till today. Fantastic, moving on to the next question, please. Yeah, let's go to the, uh, on the middle here, on the end of the row. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, you're absolutely correct, I think, in saying that Botswana is one of the top performing democracies in Africa. Yet, it has been ruled by the same political party since independence. Could you tell us why that is the case? It's very simple. We have elections every five years, and that's how people have voted ever since independence, to keep that party uh, in office. <laughs> you, uh, uh, yeah, just to follow on from that, do you think that it's potentially hazardous to the development of a democracy to have one party that's so popular with its people that it uh, has almost perhaps an automatic purchase in government? You're going to say I'm biased with my answer. <laughs> but if a democracy, if a party is performing to the expectations of the people, and I explained in my opening remarks that when I was in office, the amount of outreach I did and the consultation I did um, is on record. To be able to go out and ask people what they expect of their government, come back to my office and fashion policies and programs based on the feedback I was getting from them. And that's what I did for the entire period that I was in office. And if we were then able to give people what they wanted, and they could see that, their, that lives were improving generally, 
that even when we were having um, serious challenges like during the time of the recession, that we avoided some of the, 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 um, the declines and the detrimental and negative um, consequences of that because of good policies we'd put in place with regarding to how we maintained the stewardship of our finances. And, and people appreciated that. Then they would say that, no, let's continue voting them into office. And each election that went past, you had a party which gained, which was able to have a solid foundation, and we were always continuously getting more and more experience during the time we were in office. And we were having people who grew up in the party coming through its ranks and assuming the leadership. So there's a difference between having a party which has been in power for that long, having been elected, and a person staying in power for the same amount of time, and not necessarily being elected, or if he has been elected, is through sham elections. Sure. Great, moving on to the next question, please. Yes, let's go to the uh, hand on the inside there in the uh, red. Um, hi, so you've spoken quite a lot about corruption in other countries and how that causes particular problems, particularly with Chinese uh, workers coming into Botswana. What efforts is Botswana taking or has taken in the past 10 years to reduce corruption and to enable that to boost economic activity? Well, we um, set up a directorate on corruption and economic crime, an organization which investigates any um, corruption that uh, comes to its, its attention and then goes on to prosecute. It has a zero tolerance policy as we do in our government and um, we ensured that everybody knew that you are not immune if ever you engaged in any acts of corruption or conflict of interest. And we have proven that. Um, secondly, is that we also instituted um, other independent bodies where you saw there were opportunities for corruption. You may know that uh, in, 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 in a number of developing countries, uh, when it comes to procurement, um, state procurement, that it is ministers and the senior officials who would be able to have a say in where you buy what from who. But in Botswana, we have an independent entity that is not part of the government, which does the procurement on behalf of government. So the various ministries would be the, and their officials would prepare the tender documents, go out and find the various um, bidders uh, out there, and then fill in papers, is submitted to this independent organization, and then they are the ones who adjudicate on the bids and then award the tenders. They're not awarded by government. So that way you actually um, remove the opportunity or the temptation by those in leadership positions to succumb to, the, to that temptation uh, when it comes to procurement. We had in, in, in most ministries corruption units, anti-corruption units that were sent there by that director that I referred to. So right there in a ministry, their job was to create awareness, educate officials, and also sniff around and see if there's any um, potential for corruption and take action if there is. To also create awareness and education um, throughout society as well about the evil of corruption. <coughs> we have a dedicated judge or two who only deal with corruption cases so that there should be no delays in bringing uh, corruption cases to courts. And even the prosecution um, uh, directorate, you also have uh, um, standalone uh, prosecutors who only deal with corruption cases. So that way, we have shown our commitment as a country in dealing with uh, uh, anybody, and people know, as I say, in Botswana, if there is and I'm not saying there's no corruption in Botswana, there is. But um, we are actually tackling it and ensuring that it doesn't get to the stage 
where it becomes endemic and a way of life, as it is in some countries which are um, greatly affected. Fantastic. Moving on to the next question here. Yeah, let's, uh, let's come to the woman in the uh, row of third from frontier. Hello, Mr. President. Thank you so much for that uh, mentally stimulating talk. Um, while other African nations have, with uh, natural resources, have failed to develop economically, Botswana has prospered. The question that I always get asked as a Botswana lady is, what's the secret between, uh, behind this prosperity? I try and answer it, but I always feel like I don't give adequate answers. I know you've touched on this in your speech, but um, can you just say it again? Like, what is the secret behind our prosperity? And I'll make sure that I take notes. I, I think, I think um, it also follows on the question I was asked about having been one party, having been in office, having won the elections um, you know, for so many years. It was because unlike some others, I'm not saying all others, unlike some others, all those resources which contribute towards revenue creation are plowed back for the benefit of people. So that way, um, it means that nothing has been channeled into areas that do not benefit people or the general welfare of the nation and the environment. And I think that is what has led to enable us to be able to, through prudent economic management as well. That I think has also been very important because if you have adopted good financial policy as we have attempted to do, where we now have got foreign exchange reserves, which could be, I don't know what the latest is, is but you know it has varied from 15 to 18 months, where it was considered adequate for a country to have three months of import <coughs> cover. We have much more than that. So whenever we have had surpluses in our budget, we put the money aside for a rainy day. Um, and it's money that we know we can draw on as we had to during the time of the, of the recession. So with that kind of thing, the exchange rate policy, the interest rate policies as conducted by the, 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 the National Bank, all that has contributed towards um, the situation where we are today <coughs> and why our credit worthiness has remained as it is and stable and, and one of the best on the continent for all these years. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, let's go to the gentleman over here in the red t-shirt. Thank you very much for coming to give your uh, speech today. My grandfather, Peter Kunstler, was briefly advisor to your government on youth and development in the 1970s, so it's an, an honor to be here. My, my question is, do you think that the, kind of the current American foreign policy, or whack of it, has the potential to have a negative effect on the Southern African region? I think the American foreign policy is likely to have a negative effect on the whole world. <laughs> not, not, just, not, just, not just Southern Africa. Um, I think America is in a very bad place now under Donald Trump. And, and, and the, the, you know, the immaturity of the man is just unbelievable. I cannot understand to this day <laughs> how he ever became president. It's just unbelievable. He's the worst president um, America has ever had, and I am making a prediction tonight that he'll be the worst president America will ever have. Um, the consequences, I think, are still to be seen. And let's hope that he'll only be a one-term president, and let's even hope that he doesn't even finish his first term. <laughs> um, um, you know, when you have trade agreements, as an example, um, and he's been tearing them up left, right, and center, when, when you negotiate trade agreements, you have to make compromises. And what you come out with is not always the best thing. Um, you look at the UK going through Brexit right now. You can see that it is such a, it's a boiling pot of everything. You know, it is so difficult. And at the end of the day, whatever they agree is not going to be 
um, liked by, by, by other side. But you have to compromise. But you don't just tear up an agreement which is on the table. You sit down with that country you've got the agreement with and you say, okay, we are unhappy about this aspect or that aspect. So can we sit down and renegotiate the agreement and then move forward? And that's how it should be done. And the same even with the Iran nuclear deal. You know, just walking away from it and other countries have been, have been in there, walking away from the Paris Agreement. Tell us what the problem is. But, you know, these hurricanes which are hitting America so hard these days and, and, and getting worse in the intensity should be a wake-up call to Donald Trump that, you know, walking away from the Paris Agreement just for a short-term uh, benefit where he thinks he'll be able to create employment and create employment just so that he can take the um, you know, the credit and stay on as, as the president of the country. It's all about himself. And, and, and um, when you talk about Africa or Southern Africa, I believe deep down that Donald Trump is a racist. I have no doubt about that. And we see it in all his policies and the way he talks about people and the way he deals with other people, both in his country and around the world. So, um, what a disaster they have <laughs> as a president. I have American parents. I'm, I'm oh, I'm sorry. No, did, no. did I upset you? <laughs> not at all. It's good, it's but good I'm not going to take it back. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's good to be reminded. Yeah. Uh, let's take one final question. Uh, let's go to the woman over here. Uh, thank you, President Kama, for coming today. I wanted to ask you about conservation in Botswana. Uh, speaking of President Trump, he recently uh, allowed the import of ivory from Botswana and from other African countries. And China is obviously one of the largest importers of wildlife parts in the world. So how do you think we can encourage conservation in Africa and around the world when these large countries are seemingly encouraging the trade of wildlife parts? Really, at the end of the day, in the way we are going, is for countries in Africa to come up with their own policies um, with regard to how they want their wildlife to be utilized in a sustainable way. And during my term of office in Botswana, um, I think, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm bragging, you know, but we, we're at a very good place right now. The, 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 the wildlife numbers have come up um, uh, tremendously. In the case of the elephants, we have got too many elephants. But the reason why we've got too many elephants, and we've seen a lot of human uh, elephant conflict, especially in the last couple of years, is that by the nature, when you have good rains, elephants always leave their normal uh, range and spread further afield to allow where they've been to recover. So that in the winter months, when there's no rain or less water, they go back and they find enough vegetation and go back to where the rivers are. So we had um, a, a, a cyclone uh, last year, beginning of last year I think it was, Dineo, it was last year, and, and it brought a lot of rain. There was water all over the country and, and, and those elephants followed the water and they were all over the country as well. Um, and we had late good rains this year as well. And that water stayed there for a long time, which meant that the elephants didn't have to go back to their natural range. And they then were there at the time when people were trying to, to reap the benefits from their crops. And these elephants were there into, into people's crops and, 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 and causing havoc. Um, across the border um, in, in Zimbabwe, they have a game park and they had water points which were um, uh, man-made water points and their um, equipment was breaking down and they weren't able to repair. So the elephants ran out of water so they crossed the border into Botswana. Uh, we do have migration of elephants between us and Zimbabwe but on this occasion they came across as well, further uh, increasing the numbers in our country. And then there's wholesale po poaching in two other countries to our north, driving elephants you know, seeking refuge into Botswana, um, where we have um, had uh, 
uh, very good anti-poaching uh, operations in place. And that is why the elephant population in Botswana um, is about 40% of Africa's entire population of elephants, all crammed into one country. <coughs> so we have that serious problem of elephant um, uh, conflict with, with people. But that has come about as a result of the good management that we've put in place. And it doesn't just apply to, to elephants. Um, in the mid-90s, we were down to about five or six rhino, rhinoceros, because they'd been almost poached out. Um, our rhino population now is 40 times more than it was, you know, at that time, you know. And we have been a safe haven for rhinos that people who hold rhinos on their farms in South Africa have been sending them to Botswana to come, in, to come and be looked after in our country because they know um, they'll be safe there. So generally, and this has been recognized because our tourism is mostly wildlife based. And we have seen the the positive effects of that, of the wildlife resource that we have and how we've conserved it with tourist arrivals. And we have people from many parts of the world coming in and increasing. And the tourism organization that we have uh, in Botswana has also um, received many awards. How many did the minister say we had? Oh no, you went there. I think he said in the last 10 years, something like 38 international awards um, for tourism. And Botswana has occasionally been voted one of the best tourist desti destinations in the world, not just in Africa, on a couple of occasions as well bec because of that. So there's all been tremendous benefit as a result of that. But of course, like you say, it comes with challenges, you know, like we're talking about the elephant right now. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so mm. much for your time. With everything from a geography lesson to an invitation to tour Botswana, to caution about Chinese and American foreign policy. This has been an absolutely fascinating event. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you. Thank you.